Good morning. My name is Lene Palmasano, and I'm the vice president of the Minneapolis City Council. As you can see, I'm not President Jenkins. Uh, she's away, but returning later this afternoon. This will be my first time chairing the full council, so I ask for everybody's patience with me this morning. I'm going to call to order this regular meeting for Thursday, November 17th. This morning we have two resolutions to present before we start our other business, which we'll do before, which we'll do right now. So I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Um, first we'll do the resolution observing Transgender Day of Remembrance, and I'll turn it over to my colleagues, Council Members Wansley and Chavez for that. All right, um, so we're here to introduce um, Trans Transgender Day of Remembrance for the city of Minneapolis. Um, we're really, really proud that uh, council president as well as our staff um, worked uh, diligently to make sure that we're honoring our transgender residents and um, reaffirming that this is a safe haven for all of our transgender uh, communities and um, making sure that their rights and their lives are just respected and protected. So that said, we're gonna read the resolution uh, alongside Councilmember Chavez. So, whereas, sadly, at least 40 transgender or gender non-conforming people have already been killed in the United States in 2022, and whereas we face an epidemic of violence against transgender women of color in the United States with black and Latin ex transgender women representing a vast majority of these fatalities and experiencing violence at disproportionately higher rates. And, and whereas too often these murders and violent attacks go unreported or misreported, transgender women of color face violence every day and fear turning to law enforcement for help due to furthering interactions of violence, victim blaming, stigma, <coughs> sorry, stigmatization, and harmful characterization, including some who died this year in officer-involved shootings or in custody. And then I'll pass it to council members. Thank you. And whereas transgender and gender non-conforming people for whom we've lost in the last year due to violence perpetrated against them were neighbors, students, coworkers, friends, and family members whose lives were taken from their loved ones and from their communities. And whereas Trans Day of Remembrance is also observed as Trans Day of Resilience to celebrate the resilience and power of trans and gender non-conforming people still living, fighting for their safety and protecting each other. And whereas transgender and gender non-conforming people deserve the resources and protections necessary to be celebrated in the life and life and not only death. Now, therefore be it resolved that the mayor and city council observe November 20th as Transgender Day of Remembrance in acknowledging and mourning the lives of transgender and gender non-conforming people we've lost in the last year due to violence and recognize that there's so much work ahead in our duties to help co-create a safer, more equitable city for our transgender and gender non-conforming community members. So we're really um, excited that the council will be passing this today um, and just letting the public know, letting our community members know that transgender as well as gender um, non-binary uh, residents, their lives matter here in Minneapolis, and we have a duty to protect them, and we will fulfill that duty. So thank you all. Thank you. Next, we have the 2022 World Children's Day, which will be on November 20th, and that presentation will be given by Councilmember Vita. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Musicant, for joining me. I want to first thank all the staff and previous staff who've worked very hard on um, this acknowledgement and the work that's moving forward on um, recognizing Minneapolis as a uh, child-safe city. And so um, in honor of that, we're going to be proclaiming November 20th, 2022, as World's Children's Day. 
and the proclamation reads, whereas November 20th, 2022, marks the 33rd anniversary of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, and whereas of 196 eligible member nations of the United Nations, the United States is the only nation that has not yet ratified the UNCRC, and whereas the Child Friendly Cities Initiative was launched globally in 1996 to actualize the rights of children, recognizing the direct role local governments and mayors play in supporting and advocating for children and young people, and whereas on November 20th, 2019, the Minneapolis City Council passed a resolution to reaffirm the city's historic support beginning with Mayor Don Frazier in 1989, <laughs> in 1989 of the UNCRC and pursued designation as a child-friendly city through the United Nations International Children's Emergency Fund, USA, and whereas Mayor Jacob Fry signed a memorandum of understanding with UNICF USA on February 14, 2020, to work towards Minneapolis becoming a child-friendly city and as of the first cities in the United States to support that designation in accordance with the four overall goals in the UNCRC. Children should be free from discrimination. Government policy should be based on the best interest of the child. Children should survive and develop to their full potential and children's views and perspectives are important. And whereas the Minneapolis Youth Coordinating Board and the Minneapolis Health Department are leading the effort to support Minneapolis in becoming a child-friendly city, working with an array of community volunteers and partners, and whereas this effort undertaken in recognition of the diversity of experience, culture, and nationality represented in the youth of the city of Minneapolis is guided by the framework set forth by the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is celebrated on World's Children's Day, now, therefore, be it resolved by the city of Minneapolis that Sunday, November 20th, 2022, is recognized as World Children's Day in Minneapolis and that the residents of Minneapolis are invited to recognize World Children's Day by learning more about the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Thank you. Would you like to say more? Yes, thank you so much, um, Councilmember Vito, for reading this and for the uh, support that the City Council will give. Um, when I was commissioner, we started this uh, renewed effort, and as a continuing resident of Minneapolis, I have continued to be a, a volunteer a member of the steering committee, and so really excited to see the progress we've made, and you may hear from us maybe as soon as February that we are uh, ready to be an official designee um, with UNICEF USA. Thank you. With that, we'll return to our regular agenda, and I'll ask the, to the clerk to please call the roll and verify the presence of a quorum. Councilmember Goodman. Present. Councilmember Wansley. Present. Councilmember Johnson. Present. Councilmember Osmond is absent. Councilmember Payne. Present. Councilmember Koski. Present. Councilmember Shugtai. Present. Councilmember Chavez. Present. Councilmember Ellison. Here. Councilmember Vitoff. Present. Councilmember Rainville. Present. President Jenkins is absent. Vice President Palmasano. Present. There are 11 members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. Next, we have adoption of our agenda. Colleagues, the agenda for today's meeting is before us, and I'll ask if there are any amendments to the agenda. I'm not seeing any. I would entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Second. Thank you. The clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. There are 11 ayes. That carries and the agenda is adopted. The next item of business is acceptance of the minutes from our regular meeting on November 3rd. May I have a motion to accept those minutes? So moved. Second. The clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shuktai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. There are 11 ayes. That carries and those minutes have been accepted. Finally, we have the referral of petitions, communications, and reports to the proper committees. May I have that motion, please? So moved. 
clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. There are 11 ayes. That carries and those matters have been referred. The next order of business is reports from our standing committees, beginning with the report of our business inspections, housing and zoning committee. That report will be presented by the committee's chair, council member Goodman. Good morning, Madam Vice President, members of the council, the business inspections, housing and zoning committee today is bringing forward 14 items. Item number one is a land sale at 1804 34th Street East. Item two is an interim use permit at 4530 Lindale Avenue South. Item number three is a long list of levies for special assessments related to nuisance conditions. I will note we had a public hearing and out of all of these, only one person stood up to object and we directed them to staff. Item four is a variance and site plan review. The committee voted to deny the appeal. Item number five is a rezoning at 613, 623 Van Buren Street Northeast, which is associated with the denial of the uh, appeal. Item number six are the liquor license approvals and seven are the liquor license renewals. Item eight is our BTAB and cultural districts funding recommendations and you can see the long list of great organizations that we're funding through this. Item number nine is a change to our Minneapolis Homes Contingency Financing Fund. Item 10 is acceptance and appropriations of funds for acquisition of emergency shelters for people experiencing homelessness. Item 11 is the carry forward of our 2022 tax exempt housing revenue bond allocation. Item 12 are rezonings at the Upper Harbor Terminal and you can see there's quite a long list of those. Item 13 is a commercial property development fund for a project at 2518 North 2nd Street. And item number 14, which is a very significant item, which was discussed in the business section of the Star Tribune today, is a loan for the Building Technology and Innovation Center at 415 Royalston. I'd like to move all items and uh, ask if Councilmember Ellison could speak to item 14, please. Thank you. Councilmember Goodman has moved approval of the committee's report. Councilmember Ellison. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, this is a significant item. Um, you know, every once in a while, the city will have a unique opportunity to support a project that could bring a lot of jobs, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of income to people in areas where, uh, quite frankly, the market has 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 failed our our constituents. And this is certainly one of those projects. And so, um, was really happy to work with the the project team. Uh, Devin George, uh, oh my God, I'm, I'm gonna start naming people and forget certain folks, but Bill English um, <clears throat> and the whole team over there um, uh, is really bringing this project forward and I think got a lot of buy-in from staff, from myself, from the mayor, from the trades who uh, I think have uh, historically, you know, been been a little bit tough when it comes to new industry um, and Dan McConnell and, and, and a lot of the leadership over there has been really excited about this project and so, um, I hope that my colleagues are, are as excited to support this as I am. Um, the, uh, this is gonna be a, a modular factory to build units, to build housing units. Uh, it's gonna employ hundreds of people. Uh, the minimum, the starting wage is gonna be $31 an hour. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think that this is gonna be a, a really big deal. The project team, many of the project team, uh, Jamil Ford and others uh, uh, are not only from North Minneapolis, uh, but you know, and uh, some of the project teams still live on the north side in Ward 5, uh, which is uh, a great opportunity to be able to support our constituents as they come up with innovative and, 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 uh, and, and forward and progressive ideas. And so just wanted to name that and wanted to honor all the, all the work that they put in, honor all the work that staff put in. Uh, you know, we don't have a neat box that this fits into um, and staff really uh, uh, believed in this project and, and, and is bringing it and brought it forward with their recommendation as well. So uh, thanks to everyone and I'm excited to see this, uh, this project progress. Thank you, that's great news. Council Member Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanna follow up on Council Member Ellison's remarks. Uh, Bill English, uh, Devin George, thank you so much for the smart work and the building trades for helping uh, with, with the job creation. So. Uh, what can be better than a project that combines jobs creation as well as you know, more housing? So, uh, so happy to vote on this and thanks to all those who were involved. Is there any other discussion? The clerk will call the roll. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Koski. Aye. Council Member Shugtai. 
Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vitong. Aye. Councilmember Rainbow. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. There are 11 ayes. That carries and the report is adopted. Next, we'll have the report from our Committee of the Whole. That will, report will be presented by the Vice Chair, Councilmember Chavez. Thank you, Vice President Palmasano. Number one is the City Council Award Budget Guidelines. So it's approving the City Council Award Budget Guidelines effective January 1st, 2023. And the second item is related to homeless encampments. So it's approving a legislative directive related to homeless encampments and requests for data and information. If there's no questions, Madam Vice President, I'd move for approval. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Councilmember Chavez has moved approval of the committee's report. I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Allison. Aye. Councilmember Vitong. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. There are 11 ayes. That carries and that report is adopted. Next, we'll have the lengthy report from our Policy and Government Oversight Committee. Buckle in. That report will be presented by its chair, Councilmember Ellison. <laughs> the Policy and Government Oversight Committee is bringing forward 27 items um, and uh, that it will be recommended for approval today. So uh, one is the passage of procurement reform ordinance and related resolutions. Two is passage of the market program uh, ordinance. Three is passage of an ordinance related to the appointed positions in the Human Resources Department, Director of Labor Relations. Four is passage of an ordinance related to the appointed position in the Office of Community Safety, Neighborhood Safety Director. Five is the passage of an ordinance related to the appointed position in the Office of Community Safety, Community Safety Chief of Staff. Six is passage of resolution for the transfer of funds from the Minneapolis Police Department to the Information Governance Division of the City Clerk's Office for Public Safety Data Practices Request. Seven is the passage of resolution for the technical amendment to the 2022 six-year capital program for the Hiawatha Training and Recruitment Center and Water Distribution Facility Projects. Eight is the passage of a resolution for the gift acceptance from Local Progress for lodging and related travel expenses. Nine is approving a 2022 property tax special assessment for delinquent utility charges. 10 is approving capital long range improvement uh, committee slash click appointments. Uh, 11 is accepting bids for Alley Snow Plowing Services. 12 is accepting bid for pavement profiling and roto milling services. 13 is authorizing requests for proposals for next generation timekeeping and scheduling. 14, authorizing customization of contract form with Granicus LLC for rental data scraping services. 15 is authorizing a contract with League of Minnesota Cities Insurance Trust for patrol and peace officer accredited training online subscription. 16 is authorizing a contract with Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman LLP for IT sourcing consulting services. 17 is authorizing master contract amendment with North Point Health and Wellness Center Inc. for medical and social services. 18 is authorizing contract amendment with Rachel uh, Contracting LLC for the demolition of 30 West Lake Street. 11 is authorizing contract amendment with uh, LRG Technologies for mobile lighting trailers. 20 is authorizing contract amendment with LRG Technologies for mobile video surveillance trailers. 21 is authorizing contract amendment with uh, but but oh my God. Butiminous Roadways, Inc. for providing uh, hot mix asphalt. I did it right twice, and now on the third try, I totally stumbled over it. All right. Um, uh, 22, authorizing contract amendment with uh, Kimley Horn and Associates, Inc. for engineering and design services for Minneapolis, for Hennepin Avenue Street Reconstruction Project. 23 is uh, authorizing contract amendments for 2022 Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS, or HAPWA programming. Uh, 24 is authorizing contract amendment with Vite and Company Inc. for Upper Harbor Terminal grading and demo project. 25 is authorizing contract amendment with Everlaw Inc. for e-discovery and redaction software. 26 is authorizing uh, lease agreement with Northgate Development LLC for space at uh, 1200 Plymouth Avenue North. 27 is authorizing uh, lease agreement with uh, 927 building LLC for space for the North Minneapolis Promise Zone. And uh, 28 is apparently staff keeping Jeremiah on his toes. Um, and uh, with that, I will uh, move approval 
of uh, the committee report. Thank you. Councilmember Ellison has moved approval of that committee's report. Is there any discussion? Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, Chair Pomisano. Um, I want to speak uh, briefly uh, to item number five, which is the appointed position in the Office of Community Safety, uh, specifically for the Community Safety Chief of Staff. Um, I spoke on this item in committee, but just want to reiterate some of what I shared due to the testimony that this body heard on Tuesday's uh, budget public hearing. Um, dozens of residents shared that they urgently need more funding for public safety programs dealing with mental health, de-escalation, healing, and restorative justice. Uh, people spoke to the urgent need for resources to divert uh, young people from opioid uh, use and recovery programs. Um, these are areas that have been chronically underfunded here at the city. Um, and as the city is moving in, in the direction of supporting initiatives like that, uh, we absolutely need to be funding and supporting that work. Um, but I do want to acknowledge it's happening very slowly for our residents, and that's exactly what we heard on Tuesday. Um, this agenda item is relevant to that because um, it is partially being funded by parts of MPD surplus budget of about $3 million. Uh, typically, budget surpluses are returned to the city's general fund, but this year, MPD um, has worked out an informal agreement uh, with the Office of Community Safety and the Budget Office to donate some of their access budget to cover the cost of this position. Um, I think it's absolutely logical that you know, we should be looking at how we can repurpose MPD's budget surplus towards fully staffing and resourcing uh, our new public safety system in office, um, which does emphasize a comprehensive approach. Um, and it will also be logical to not just stop with this single position, but to use some of that excessive $3 million surplus, um, which is not being used by MPD right now to meet some of the residents' urgent needs for public safety services and programs other than police. So I look forward to uh, working with my colleagues and staff over the next coming days as we're in budget, um, in the budget season to bring forward budget amendments that reflect um, those needs of our residents that we heard on Tuesday. And I hope this item passes today um, and any council member that supports it, I hope can also support using that surplus for other public safety initiatives as well. So I just want to highlight that. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will call the roll. <coughs> council member Goodman. Aye. Council member Wansley. Aye. Council member Johnson. Aye. Council member Payne. Aye. Council member Koski. Aye. Council member Shugtai. Aye on all except seven. I'm sorry, except for number seven. Council member Chavez. I am everything except item number seven. Council member Ellison. Aye. Council member Vita. Aye. <clears throat> Council member Rainville. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. There are 11 ayes on the report except for number seven, which has uh, nine ayes and two nays. Council member Wansley. Yes, sorry. I would like to also correct my vote on item number seven and switch that to a nay. There are eight ayes and three nays. Thank you. That carries and the report is adopted. Our Public Health and Safety Committee report is next, which will be presented by its chair, Council Member Vita. Thank you, Madam President. The Public Health and Safety Committee is bringing forward six items that it is recommending for approval. Item one is the passage of an ordinance relating to the security of reproductive health care facilities. Item two is authorizing an increase to the Minnesota Timberwolves contract for bomb detection security services. Item three is authorizing a revenue contract with the Minnesota Twins for bomb detection security services. Item four is accepting a reimbursement from the Minnesota Board of Firefighter Training and Education for the Firefighter Training. Item five is approving appointments to the Public Health Advisory Committee. Item six is the passage of a resolution proclaiming November 20, November 20th, 2022 as World Children's Day. Thank you. Council Member Vita has moved approval of the committee's report. Is there any discussion? Council Member Vita. Uh, I would just like to ask, Madam Chair, I would just like to ask uh, Council Member Goodman, who's done, and her staff, who's done a great deal of work on the uh, Reproductive Health Care Facilities Ordinance, if we could all be added as authors, the entire council be added. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Council Member Wansley. Uh, 
Council Member Vita kind of stole the request already. I'm super excited you let that. I'm looking forward to supporting this initiative and really glad to see this um, body continue standing for safeguarding abortion um, access and rights for all of our residents here. And this is just another step in which we we're demonstrating that co commitment. So thank you, Council Member Goodman. Council Member Ellison. Uh, yeah, just want to thank the thank the body, but also thank Councilmember Goodman um, and all of my colleagues who are working on various things to protect reproductive rights, to protect abortion rights. Um, I think it's really important work. Um, I think it's uh, and I think it's really uh, commendable and inspiring to watching to watch you and watch all of us stand up to intimidation, to stand up to um, uh, people who might want to restrict other people's rights. Um, and I know this can, it can be really hard, a hard lift. Um, and, uh, and I'm definitely keeping in mind the people that we're protecting uh, with this ordinance. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Council Member Goodman. Uh, thank you, Madam President. This morning I woke up, as many of you did, to the Metro headline, codifying abortion access is a top priority. And while I was happy and relieved that legislative leaders are saying out loud what they campaigned on in this election, there is no such thing as abortion rights without access. And there are many angles we can look at access from. We can look at access to women who have to travel long distances. We can look at access from the point of view of women who have children who need to be in daycare and have to travel long distances or even short distances and find childcare to be able to access their reproductive rights. We can look at access as it pertains to the funding required if you don't have insurance or can't, uh, for some reason, access state funding. But we can also look at access from the point of view of what it takes for anyone accessing health care at a Planned Parenthood or other clinic from being able to enter the clinic safely, free of harassment and intimidation, essentially under the guise of free speech. And so that is what we're here to deal with today. Now, many of you know I was the executive director of Minnesota NARAL for many years. It was the job I had prior to the one I serve on now, serve in now. And after that, I served on the board of the Midwest Health Center for Women, an abortion clinic in downtown Minneapolis, one that no longer exists. I then served and still currently do serve on the board of the Midwest Health Center for Women Foundation, which is an abortion access fund. And I have seen firsthand the kinds of requests we get from around the state of Minnesota to be able to deal with some of these financial access issues. This is an issue that I thought would have been resolved a long time ago. And unfortunately, it has not been. It, is, uh, it, almost, it makes me almost cry to see the commitment and dedication of so many council members, next generation council members, who really care about this issue as much as I did then and do now. And I'm really proud that everyone has agreed to put their name on this resolution uh, to stand up for the fact that Minneapolis residents believe it's not just about passing laws, but it's making sure that everyone has access. If you would indulge me, I just want to make a couple of thank yous. I'll start with Zach Schultz in my office. Oh, to be in your 20s and come to City Hall and be asked to spend five months of your life working on trying to do something that threads the needle between access and free speech. To work with the clerk's office and all of the others who have been working on this, I give him a lot of credit. I'm sure when he agreed to work in my office as a policy aide, he didn't think this would be the first thing we would ask him to shepherd through, but he's an example of that next generation leader who cares about this issue as much as anyone else, and I'm really proud of the work that he did. I'm also really proud of the work of Amy Shutt. Amy Shutt is uh, an incredible attorney in the city attorney's office who has been steadfast in making sure that we had an ordinance that was legally defensible, yet worked for clinics and access to reproductive health care in our city. Uh, she is one of these unsung heroes that many of us had not met, met up until this point, and I'm sure she's proud of this work, and I'm sure she faced a lot of obstacles internally and externally in order to get to this point. I want to shout her out. I also want to thank 
great, with incredible gratitude, the clinic escorts and volunteers who have been on the front lines doing this work every day up until this point. You know, it's hard to stand out there in the cold for free and do what you think is right. And I'm just really grateful as I look at you in the audience and the many, many others of you who have really worked hard our whole lives to ensure that women have access to everything that Planned Parenthood provides. When, when women are being harassed at clinics, they could be coming in for a pap smear. They could be coming in for contraception. They could be coming in for any one of many services. And this kind of harassment also dissuades people from coming in for that kind of care. And so I'm really grateful for the volunteers and the clinic escorts and the people who have put their lives on the line to make sure we have access to this right. I am, uh, many of you know, I had the good fortune when I worked at Minnesota NARAL to work with Tim Stanley directly. We worked together and he has still agreed to be in the movement as a leader at Planned Parenthood, as a seventh ward resident, and along with his team of staff at Planned Parenthood, they have not moved out of the area and they have determined that they're going to stand firm whether there's controversy or not in order to protect women's rights and women's access. And I'm really proud of the Planned Parenthood team and all of the people that you brought to the table. Although it's November, this has been going on since April and uh, we wanted to make sure to get to this point we had something that we were confident will withstand a legal challenge and we're pretty confident. So therefore, I want to thank you all for the work that you have done and my colleagues for signing on as co-sponsors. Never in my um, 25 years of being here have I ever gotten to do something as meaningful in the reproductive rights movement. I am proud of the fact that the institution, the mayor, the administration, the council have come to an agreement that women deserve access. We want the state to do something, but we want women to have access right now. And this will make a difference in women's lives. Thank you so much. Thank you. There's a couple more people that would like to speak on this. Council Member Vita. I'm going to speak on item six. Item six is the um, resolution for World Children's Day. I just want to acknowledge all of the hard work that um, our staff has put into this. I want to thank former Commissioner Musicant again, also Anne DeGroot, and our current uh, interim Commissioner of Health, Heidi Ritchie, and also my team. You know, this is exciting for us. This Actually, this agenda is one of the most exciting ones for me as chair of this committee. There's a lot of work that is still being put into us being a child-friendly city, and so I just want to acknowledge the years there's been decades of work put into this. So thank you all so much for the hard work and the continued work to make this happen. Thank you. Council Member Payne. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Yeah, I, I'm struggling on how to, I want to talk about this and acknowledge this, but our, our, our healthcare system is so fundamentally broken. And when we talk about access to reproductive care, we're talking about abortion as health, that is healthcare. And that is a really hard decision to make, and that should be a person's right to make that choice. And we're also talking about trying to have kids and the types of, of barriers and challenges there are to advocate for yourself when it comes to that side of the reproduct reproductive access. And I'm just really grateful that we are centering the needs of women as they're making healthcare choices and we're removing the types of barriers that there are already enough barriers in our healthcare system when it comes to advocating for patients' rights, especially women who are patients. And so I'm so glad that we're bringing this forward. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. There are 11 ayes. That carries and that report is adopted. And finally, we have the report from our Public Works and Infrastructure Committee, and that report will be presented by its chair, Councilmember Johnson. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. 
this uh, Public Works and Infrastructure Committee brings forward nine items. The first is the 2022 SAC appropriation and revenue increase. The second is the 2023 Street Resurfacing Program project, project designation, cost estimate, and setting of public hearings. The third item is a contract and easement with Canadian Pacific for the 37th Avenue Northeast Street Reconstruction Project. The fourth item is the Metro Blue Lines extension uh, Business Advisory Committee and Community Advisory Committee appointments. The fifth item is an agreement with MnDOT for the Plymouth Avenue Bridge Rehabilitation Project. The sixth item is the Park Lane Neighborhood Street Reconstruction Project designation, cost estimate, and setting of public hearings. The uh, seventh item is the Capital Projects Closeouts with Appropriation, Bond Reallocation, and Revenue Adjustments within the City's Capital Project Enterprise Fund and Declaration of Official intent to issue bonds. The eighth item is a block event permit for the warehouse district. And the ninth item are updates to the parking and mobility services fee and rate schedule. And with that, Madam uh, Chair, I will go ahead and move all nine items. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Johnson has moved approval of the committee's report. Is there any discussion? Is there any discussion? Clerk will call the roll. Council Member Goodman. Aye. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Johnson. Aye. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Koski. Aye. Council Member Shugtai. Aye. Council Member Chavez. Aye. Council Member Allison. Aye. Council Member Vitov. Aye. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. There are 11 ayes. That carries and the report is adopted. That completes the reports of our standing committees. The next order of business is our introduction and referral calendar. Pursuant to notice, Councilmember Wansley will be introducing and giving first reading to the subject matter of an ordinance to amend the Housing Maintenance Code to repeal Section 244.60 entitled Temporary Housing Prohibited Exception, which will be referred to the Business Inspection Housing and Zoning Committee in the next cycle. Are there any questions from council members on that introduction? Councilmember Wansley. Yeah, thank you. Um, Chair Palmasano, um, I just want to speak to this quickly. Um, so earlier, I'm very grateful that this body, you know, passed the directive uh, authored by my colleagues that will give council basic information that we need to make informed decisions around encampment responses. And that directive will come back in March. But in the meantime, we also need to take urgent action to approach unhoused residents with the goal of actually getting everyone safe stable and no barrier housing that they need um, in order to thrive. And just across the river in St. Paul, we've seen um, the city is much more successful than we are at addressing the needs of unhoused people. Uh, currently, Minneapolis is exasperating the problem by pushing residents from one place to another through brutal, expensive, and ineffective evictions. Uh, residents are losing IDs, medicine, and shelter, and they're also losing housing placements and other social services um, as we continue to carry out these evictions. Um, while my colleagues and I continue to work towards um, creating a comprehensive policy that centers housing first, um, I also look forward to working alongside community members and my colleagues and continuing to hold the mayor and our department heads accountable um, if they continue to move forward with these inhumane evictions. Um, and this is just one of the steps in hopefully moving us away from that practice that we have um, seen time and time again to not be the effective way in supporting our unhoused neighbors. Um, so just wanted to give some context and look forward to working on this. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Councilmember Goodman. No. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. No. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. No. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vita. No. Councilmember Rainville. No. Vice President Palmasano. No. There are five ayes and six nays. Thank you. Um, that motion does not carry. And with that motion failing, I assume the will of the body would be to return that motion to author. Do we have such a motion? Councilmember Chavez? I, I want to get some maybe questions answered from our city clerk, if that's OK, or you, uh, Vice President Palmasano. But this was just referring work to a committee mm -hmm. to get work done. I think that is the work of this body. Whether or not we agree with that ordinance or not, the work of this body is to do work. So I'm just confused why that failed. Uh, 
uh, Madam Chair, Madam Vice President, I, I can't speak to why the matter failed. The, the vote came out where the process didn't pass. However, uh, in general, in terms of ordinance processes, uh, ordinances being the uh, legislative enactment of the body, meaning it's local laws that govern the community, there is uh, an initial two-step process before work really begins. The first process is notice has to be given in a regular meeting of city council, and that was happened uh, at the last council cycle. No action is taken on notice. Notice is uh, a matter of giving members of the body and the community a heads up that a certain matter that is within the code or the charter is being considered by the body. So notice was properly given in the last cycle. The first formal vote or action taken by the body then is that introduction, first reading, and referral. Those are three separate actions that we typically take as one action. Uh, it's the formal introduction of that matter and it's first reading, meaning the charter requires two readings of every ordinance. Um, that is official action of the body. The first is taken at introduction, the second is taken at the final vote. So uh, the vote that's taken today is accommodating those three formal actions. The formal introduction, granting that ordinance its first reading, and then referring it to committee for actual work. Um, and because of that, the vote uh, is required to get it its first reading and make, make its referral. So that explains the process uh, of, of first reading and introduction. Thank you. Council Member Vito. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I'd like to make the motion to return to the author. Thank you. There's a motion on the floor that has been seconded. Council Member Wanson. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to make clear for the public what just happened. So, um, introducing um, a referral for us to. Um, further modify and change the current code that was created in 1950s, late 1950s, um, that's being used to carry out these brutal evictions. Um, our ability as a council to modify that language um, just failed, um, and it is disappointing to see, I will name that, um, that we're currently, I'm glad again, that we're taking efforts to gather information that information is happening or will be uh, reported back to this body in March. Um, this was an opportunity for us to be responsive to the right now because there's snow on the ground right now. People are losing their items. People are encountering other further disabilities and healthcare issues because they're currently outside right now without housing. And this was an opportunity to do that. Um, also, I will note, you know, I believe that this builds off of the actions that were already passed um, by council member Chavez and uh, council member Chuck Tide this summer, uh, where we literally passed this similar process. Um, so I look forward to working with those colleagues as this has been opened up um, just in July. Um, but I will say this is a very disappointing uh, situation that we are willing to wait until March um, instead of attending to our urgent crisis right now, as we've seen St. Paul do, um, way better and do so that honors the humanity and the needs of our unhoused residents. And I'm committed to that regardless of when my colleagues decide to join on into that commitment too. Thank you, Council Member Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. One of the statements I just heard was that our ability to modify that language just failed, and that is factually incorrect, because in July, this actual ordinance language was opened up, as was later mentioned, which I'm glad that that was mentioned. That's the ability for this council, and that work is actually already before this council, to be able to amend that language and do something. I think that is the responsible approach personally rather than outright repeal. As there were comments made earlier around uh, inhumanity, I think the conditions in a lot of these homeless encampments are inhumane. We received a very thoughtful uh, email from city staff about all the work they do to support uh, on unsheltered individuals. That includes entry assessment with Hennepin County for housing or case management connections to existing caseworkers, connection to service providers, storage through the downtown improvement district, connection to shelter services, medical attention with health care for the homeless, transportation to resources as well. There is a ton of work that our staff are doing today on this. There is opportunity for this council to further add policy around this. That's something multiple council members have started the process for that 
I, uh, I would uh, be willing to suggest probably every council member on this body supports the efforts around. And then I'll also further mention that I put in a call to the mayor's office because I wanna see more policy around this. I wanna see more transparency around uh, homeless encampments. And I was encouraged by the work that they are doing and will soon be announcing around this uh, as well that is modeled after other cities too. So I don't wanna um, steal their thunder in that regard, but we have to work with our partners in the administration as well on this. So uh, that's why I did not support outright repeal uh, today, which is what was introduced because uh, we already have started the work to do the amending and to add additional policy that I do think is really important work for this body to do. Thank you. I'll take myself out of queue. Thank you, Councilmember Johnson. I feel like he spoke same similar things that I would have shared. Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Um, just to uh, piggyback off of a comment that Councilmember Johnson just raised, we did receive um, an email uh, from staff um, per uh, well, following up to a request that I had on Tuesday when we voted on the uh, legislative directive um, that passed today around encampment responses for uh, our staff that carries out um, our encampment uh, response team. Um, I wanted to know what was our approach for this winter, and I'm glad that staff got back. Um, a, a pretty decent email that outlines what um, you know methods and what practices that team will be leading. But I do want to know again. In that email, it did not include how we're stopping um, the destruction of our residents' personal property. It does not include any information about whether or not um, in these eviction processes will um, unhoused residents' uh, medicine will continue to be thrown away that they need. Um, also, again, it did not explicitly name um, how we're working with our partners at the county level um, and also across the enterprise uh, to make sure that there's uh, minimal police contact um, with our unhoused residents during this eviction. So while I agree in naming who's responsible is the mayor's office that are carrying out um, or giving the thumbs up around these evictions, um, I do wanna know those policy components, that is our job. That is the job of this body. That is not the job of the mayor. And that is what really this code had us, uh, given us additional opportunity to do, considering again, we're operating from a code that was authored back in 1950. And that's being used as the basis for an approach that is not effective and that other cities have recognized and are not leading. Um, so. I just wanted to note and provide some clarification of while our staff has been uh, responsive with some of the things that they're doing in the me meantime, it has not been codified in any type of policy practice, and it still doesn't address uh, many of the issues that's happening during our evictions that's creating this whack-a-mole approach with our unhoused neighbors, and that's actually interrupting unhoused neighbors from getting the services like housing, like mental health, like substance abuse, um, services that the county and other partners are providing. Our evictions is literally interrupting and basically um, holding back that work um, so that we're not constantly seeing our unhoused communities grow. So I did want to name and provide some clarification around those um, matters too. Councilmember Chavez. Uh, Vice President Palmasano, I just want to get some, make it clear to the public, today's vote was not to stop evictions in the city of Minneapolis. It was for council members to be able to do their jobs, to refer this work to a committee, where later that vote would take place. Like that was the vote we took today. That's like me saying as a council member that weeks ago, this body took a vote to make sure unhoused neighbors do not have storage. It's like me saying that this body took an inhumane approach to make sure that we can evict an encampment if there's no shelter beds. Like the vote today was not related, and, it, it, and I, get, I understand the, 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 what's happening, but the vote today was to do the work of a council member to legislate and do policy making. It was not to stop evictions. So I just want to make that very clear. That vote would have taken place in this committee. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Seeing no further discussion, clerk, please call the roll on the return to author motion. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtime. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Allison. Aye. Councilmember Vitan. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. 
Vice President Palmasano. Aye. There are 11 ayes. Thank you. That motion passes and the subject matter has been returned to author. The next order of business is resolutions and we have one honorary resolution that was read at the beginning of the meeting. The other, the World Children's Day piece was part of the public safety report. Are there any further comments from my colleagues on the Transgender Day of Remembrance resolution? I would entertain a motion to adopt that resolution. Second. Thank you. The clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Goodman. Aye. Councilmember Wansley. Aye. Councilmember Johnson. Aye. Councilmember Payne. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Councilmember Shugtai. Aye. Councilmember Chavez. Aye. Councilmember Ellison. Aye. Councilmember Vitar. Aye. Councilmember Rainville. Aye. Vice President Palmasano. Aye. There are 11 ayes. That carries and the resolution has been adopted. Colleagues, we've completed the business on our agenda and will now take up any announcements. Do any council members have announcements to share this morning? I'll put myself in queue for one. I'll call in council member Ellison first. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Um, I, uh, I forgot to ask for the numbers uh, from the clerks, but I just wanted to thank our elections team. We had a, a really tremendous election. Um, and, uh, you know, I know from firsthand being able to vote at the Early Vote Center uh, on Plymouth Avenue, uh, it was a tremendous experience. Um, all the volunteers, all the staff, um, just like, you know, can't, can't sing their praises uh, high enough. And, um, and, uh, and, and all the feedback I've gotten from constituents, you know, I'm, I'm this isn't data, this is maybe confirmation bias, but every, everything that I've heard um, indicates that uh, our team yet again executed a really excellent election. I'm excited. I know that at some point we'll get an update from the, from the elections team about what the numbers were and how they compared to previous years and all that kind of analysis, and I don't have that in front of me now, but um, just wanted to thank, thank elections, thank the clerk's office, um, and, uh, and yeah, that's it. Thank you. Um, I had an opportunity to see our new election and voter services director, Katie Smith, on an escalator going the opposite way yesterday, and I didn't have a chance to, to say as much as I had wanted to, to her, but I think that this was, this was a lot to take on as you're brand new to the city, and I really appreciate her and everybody that worked on this election with her. Clerk Carl, did you want to add anything? Madam Chair, I was going to just add uh, uh, Council Member Ellison's prompting. In the 2022 general gubernatorial election, we had 178,848 ballots cast. That was almost a 69% turnout of our registered voter base, 68.5. Quite significant. Um, the state has reported that I think we're at 65 or 66 percent, according to the Secretary of State, once again leading the nation, so still holding the record as the voting a state, and we're the voting a city in that state. So uh, appreciate the work of the elections team, our brand new elections director, Katie Smith, um, all of our election workers who join us every year, and especially for the support from our policymakers who make it all possible. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Wansley. Yes, um, I just want to encourage residents to uh, check out Sanctuary Supply Depot. Um, they are a mutual aid network comprised of a number of residents who have stepped up um, in the absence of the city and supporting our unhoused neighbors to collect tents, to collect uh, food supplies, to help people uh, when their medicines are being destroyed in, as a result of the city's brutal evictions. Um, so in knowing that, again, this body has not taken action to address the fact that we have encampments right now during this winter, um, our residents have been asking um, and putting calls to actions out for uh, folks to make donations and support them. So I encourage you all um, to check out through social media and website, the Sanctuary uh, Supply Depot, um, to really, again, uh, support our neighbors who are stepping up um, in the absence of us um, and making sure our unhoused neighbors are being able to weather this winter um, as best as they can. Thank you. Before we adjourn, colleagues, I wanted to remind the public that due to the federal holiday next week, we won't be having any council meetings. So I wish everyone a safe and happy week with your family and your loved ones as we both give thanks and remember the complex history of the land on which our country sits, um, land that was stolen from the indigenous people and the traditions, customs, values, spirituality, ceremonies, language, and more that was erased or appropriated. So it's important that we center this acknowledgement and also celebrate this coming week. Uh, are there any other announcements? We've completed our business today and with nothing further to become 
coming before the council and without objection, I adjourn this meeting to December 6th at 6.05 p.m. And that will be to receive public comment on the truth and taxation um, noticed part of our budget process and adopt the proposed 2023 city budget and tax levy, the fiscal year 2023 consolidated plan and the proposed water and sewer rates. So thank you everyone. Thank you.